we're delighted to have two uh, leading international operators here um, looking at flying to Asia, and even more delighted that Sarah Carmetta is going to moderate this one. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah. Thanks, Alistair. Good, after, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Or is it still morning? It's uh, morning. Good morning. Um, it's great to be here again, second year, uh, moderating at uh, CJI and talking about airports access in Asia. And today we have Fabian and Mark with us. Uh, Fabian Bello was born in Cuba and uh, migrated to Miami. He's worked all over. He was in logistics before, so he's only been doing business aviation for 10 years, similar to me, although I started at a younger age than he did. Um, it's very funny for me to be up here moderating uh, in front of everyone because I clearly remember when I was 19 years old doing my first dispatch trip, had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I know some of you think that was yesterday. It was five years ago. Just joking. Um, and then today we also have Mark with us, and he's been in aviation 30, for 30 years. He's worked all over the world. I started very young. <laughs> Um, European operations, he was in Mexico as well, and since 2011 he's been in Dubai. So w today we'll have a discussion about their viewpoints on Asia, and we've got some questions that we'll be polling. Um, actually, is there a clicker, Alistair, for the... No, just for the slides. Big buttons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> eject. Um, all right. So in the U.S., as many of you know, business aviation actually started bef before commercial aviation, and there's over 5,000 airports that are accessible. Um, less than, I think, 10 percent are actually, 11 uh, percent are actually used by the commercial airlines, which means business aviation has a much greater capability to travel around. There's existing infrastructure, and that's not something we see here in Asia. Um, Fabian, what, what is your viewpoint in terms of the, the airport situation we have in Asia, and how can we, we won't have the same model as the U.S., of course, but what are some of the ideas that you think we can use to solve? My first question would be why, why not? But uh, it, it, it would make things a lot easier if we didn't have to compete with the commercial airlines. I mean, even the same uh, previous topic with, with uh, India, it's going to take nine years to build all these other airports. I think uh, it, the problem is probably going to get worse, right? So we have a lot of spoiled people that just can get on an airplane and leave whenever they want. And the biggest challenge is when they have to go to Asia, they get a slot, they can't be late, they have to be on time. And these people now have to conform to rules that their life is not used to. Right? So that's always the, uh, I think, the biggest uh, challenge for us going into Asia or India or somewhere else where, where we, are, we are restricted. Um, and Mark, what would you say from your viewpoint being in Dubai, uh, what are some of the things, David Best had a slide up last year where it talked about most of the airports in this part of the world will reach capacity either from a terminal standpoint or the runway standpoint by 2023, all of the major airports. Um, from your perspective, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think the one here is um, the benefit of dedicated facilities. And, uh, you know, if we look at other regions, um, when you've got a dedicated airport for GA, uh, like Farnborough, that's an ideal world scenario. Works very, very well. Why? Because um, the FBO does a wonderful job, but also actually controls the whole customer experience um, in terms of slots, the airport itself. Now, if we look at um, uh, Dubai, Dubai World Central, they've got dedicated airport facilities. There are a whole area set aside for GA, um, over th uh, 300,000 square meters of parking um, and everything on site, catering, cleaning, um, you, the customs immigration, all the services. And, you know, again, if we look at something else here, the, the FBOs, and again, if you can have the whole facility, it's lovely, but a dedicated FBO, and I think that's really important in terms of customer experience. Why? Because the first thing they see when uh, coming to the city, coming to the country, is the FBO facility and also the last thing they see. Um, so I think FBO facilities is something uh, that could be worked upon. It's an opportunity. 
Um, the numbers I had, um, I, I read somewhere, over a thousand airports in Asia and only 6.3% have got dedicated FBO facilities. So that's, to me, an opportunity. I would agree with you. You know, 10 years ago when I was working in Van Nuys and I was starting to do international trips, we definitely saw that there's these private terminals, but there aren't actually FBOs. So the experience is very different and customers feel like they're being mixed with commercial traffic. And a lot of times they are. You know, I know in Japan, they well, recently opened up a new uh, private terminal, but in a lot of the airports, the passengers are mixed with commercial traffic. Um, and that takes away from the point of having a business tool. And I think that's why the perception is it's a luxury item here instead of a productivity and efficiency tool. All right, so one of our poll questions is up, and I think it's very clear in the audience that Asia seems to be thought of as the most difficult location to operate into. Um, I would agree with that statement, you know, being based in Asia for the last eight years and working with associations like ASBA. Um, it's really difficult, like you mentioned, Vabi, and you have slot-controlled airports. The slots don't often match up. I mean, we all know the situation in Hong Kong has been a bit of a debacle since 2015, and while it has improved, it still is an issue, and we don't have the luxury where Singapore might have two airports. We've only ha have one in Hong Kong, um, and like you mentioned, Fabian, as well, all the airports are being utilized for commercial traffic. So, um, in terms of that, what was what is your recommendation with some of the military airports, and how can we? Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. If 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 at some point um, China, in particular, uh, could take some of their military airports and maybe turn them or allow business aviation to go into it, I think that will definitely help yeah. in being able to get people in and out of there because the reality is in the next 10 years, you know, their middle class is getting bigger. There's going to be a lot more airlines, a lot more traffic, which unfortunately for us in business aviation, they see us kind of like the stepchild. They want to move millions of people, not just the one guy. And it will be a while before they get that that one guy is responsible for the middle class in the millions of people, right? So I think there's gonna be a process before that kind of clicks in together. Um, I also think after this whole summit with, with the US and, and North Korea, uh, you know, if there is a movement towards peace in the region, that may be another good reason uh, to maybe take some of these military airports and feel a little bit more comfortable that they don't have to be or you don't have to have as many, uh, or, at, or at least open it up a little bit uh, more. I see that the second poll there is South America. So as a Cuban, if anybody has an issue with South America, just reach out to me. I pretty much can get you anywhere in South America very quickly, regardless of what the rules are. <laughs> so I think South America, your experience down there is going to be similar with Asia in terms of it's not an even playing field. Um, Definitely. From your viewpoint operating as charter, and then Mark, I'd like to hear from you as well. How, do you think it's an even playing field in Asia? Do you think that will ever change? No, it's not. I mean, I think uh, it's very similar to the, uh, you know, I think all these countries are pretty much the same. It's who you know. Um, you'll have, you know, uh, call handler A, and I won't mention any names, but handler A will say, well, these are the rules and we can't work against it. Then you, may, you call a local handler, someone that you know, or you call a friend, and they say, you know what, call so-and-so, they'll be able to get you that permit. And at the end, you're getting it through a handling company. But somehow, they made it happen. That wasn't really whatever the rules are supposed to be. So there's a 72-hour waiting period. Someone somehow can do it in 24. So it turns out to be, uh, you know, who do you know versus what the rules actually are. So the, it's not an even playing field, and I think... Some operators distinguish themselves as being a little bit better because at the end of the day, if you're able to pull off a trip that someone else can't, it does give you a competitive advantage, but at the same time, it's, it's definitely not an even playing field when it should be. Right. Can I? I think that's uh, particularly the case, as Fabia mentioned, with permissions and permits. And, uh, you know, we can, you know, go by the book, um, depending on country, it can be four hours, it can be 24 hours, 48 or even 72 hours. That's given there's no national holidays. Um, that's what the book says. Uh, that's very difficult uh, to present to owners. Uh, when you've got an airline departing in six hours and you're having to say to them, you're going to have to wait 48 hours. 
And again, you need to brief on worst case scenario, and then hopefully it gets better than that. Um, but to me, this is an area for um, you know, frustration for ownerships. You buy a, a $60 million asset, it's a time machine, and then you're told you can't depart for two days, and the airline's going in a few hours. Um, so to me, and this is maybe a, a learning from other regions, you know, four hours I think is sufficient. Um, why anybody would need more than that, I don't know. E-systems um, to actually do things online may just level the playing field. Why? Because then you haven't got these agents, some people that can do it quickly. How do you do it quickly? And I won't speculate too much on that. Yes, I, I would agree with that. And as a visitor, you are managing expectations of owners that have this asset that they are able to call up two hours later, be taking off. And even from the United States to places in Europe, they can get their slots while they're in the air, while they're doing their tech stop. Whereas here, you really can't do that. I mean, I've, I've worked for an operator where some of the owners, they have their connections within the government and maybe they are allowed to go and then maybe the next time they're not. Um, but that makes it very difficult when you're telling the owner who's just purchased this aircraft thinking he can now go to visit his factories, actually I need to know your schedule a week in advance and I don't, I'm sorry your meeting changed but you now have to fly the airline and let me move your aircraft for you. So I think managing expectations as a visitor as well as being based here is one of the key issues that I think everyone in the audience would agree with, whether that's from the legal side or the financing side, even selling of the aircraft. Um, so I'm going to just change this slide. And I think one of the things that um, we need to touch on here, Fabian, you said you, we're going to run out of time. Yes, we're building some new airports. I know China's building some new airports. Beijing has the airport in the south that they're working on. But we really need to look at the connectivity aspect. And uh, having that air transport with helicopters, or even now Hong Kong, the overflow is Macau. But that, Fabian, you've told me before, and I've had other owners say as well, I'm not going to fly my aircraft into Macau and then take the ferry. So what, what are some of the solutions? I know, um, Mark, you had some ideas from the Middle East. And, and yeah, I think you're very right, Sarah. Um, public transport um, really doesn't work in our industry, um, not in the same way as it does elsewhere. Um, in terms of helicopters and uh, UAVs, which I think all a matter of time, whether we're looking at two years, whether we're looking at five years, they're on their way. Um, I think this is uh, you know, something that can be looked at, but again, there's a couple of prerequisites for that. Um, you know, in, in terms of why would a VIP passenger want to use a helicopter or a UAV? Now, it, it's about time efficiency. It can occasionally uh, be about prestige. And the last time we actually used a helicopter that I recall out of, uh, out of the VIP terminal in Dubai was exactly that prestige. Um, uh, film star looking to go to the Burj El Arab and make an entrance. But the principal two reasons I believe that uh, helicopters are used for VIP passengers is time. Um, again, in Dubai, you can get pretty much everywhere within 40 minutes, so that really is not a factor there. But elsewhere in the world, London, New York, Los Angeles, you know, if you are going to spend Bangkok, um, spend a lot of time in traffic, um, then you know, it, it works. Um, and then the second reason, uh, security. And thanks to God, we don't actually have that issue um, in Dubai. But again, if you look at um, cities that do have some, some challenge, uh, Mexico City, uh, Rio, Sao Paulo, helicopters work well. So one of the things in a past life I was given was to you know, have a look at helicopter connectivity from Dubai. And there's about three, three licensed heliports now. And if you have a look at that, um, that really, given what I've just said, it doesn't work. If you're going to have to take the helicopter, go around the flight path, it's going to take you 20 minutes. Um, and then you're actually landing 20 minutes away or 10 minutes away from your hotel. So I think there's, um, you know, helicopters and we're seeing, you know, these UAVs. Um, I think it's going to be a five years before the UAVs come along, but I would suggest that the, um, the requirement is pretty much the same as helicopters as to why you would use a UAV. Um, again, whether they're going to be able to take your baggage is another matter, but we could say the same for helicopters. 
In, in Dubai, do you see, do you foresee this um, coming into play? Obviously, here in Asia, we have the airspace controlled by the military, uh, especially in China, places like China. I am seeing in the Philippines, we did a, as well, recently did a visit there. We went around and they're talking on how they are planning on building the roads to connect. You know, there's a lot of traffic there, but also putting heliports on top of the buildings so that it, like in Jakarta and in Indonesia, we can cut out that traffic. Um, is, is that something in Dubai that you're seeing? They, they have these self-sustaining cities with the driverless cars already, I know, but it's more of a concept. Do you think this will come into play in the real world soon? Okay, um, mentioned heliports. Um, I think it's probably about 40 landing pads on the top of uh, skyscrapers in Dubai, uh, for whatever reason, none of them licensed. Um, but the, uh, the UAV concept, um, I think, will come about. I believe Dubai will probably be the first. Um, His Highness has, has already got behind the project. Timeline, um, maybe somebody could have a, a better guess than I, but I think we're probably five years away, is my personal opinion. Fabian, you and I were having a conversation the other day with regards to Sao Paulo and the helicopter use there. Um, what are your viewpoints on the connectivity, and do you think that those solutions can be used in Asia? No, definitely, and I think that if you're going to have remote airports that are, you're not going into like the one in Beijing and you're 20, 30 minutes away, a helicopter is, is, is a must. And, and if these, uh, you know, these machines can just land on the buildings, they'll just make everything much more efficient. The issue is, in China particularly, it's going to be the airspace is so regulated. So again, it goes back to at some point, they're going to have to look at it and say, we need to make some changes because the outdated, maybe more archaic, from 30, 40, 50 years ago needs to advance to catch up with the needs of an emerging capitalistic market where you have all this wealth um, that's being generated that's going to trigger people wanting airplanes and then you have to be able to fulfill that need or the market is just never going to expand or get to the point that it's like, yeah, I'd like to buy an airplane, but if I have nowhere to park it, I have nowhere to land and I have to give you a schedule three months in advance, it's just not, the whole benefit of, of having a, an aircraft all of a sudden is, is just went out the window. You're better off flying first class to the nearest place where you could actually use your aircraft or you'll base it there or not even have it be registered or, or whatever. So, that, uh, you know, once you expand on the airport capabilities to have more than one as an option, create a general aviation alternative, then you need the transportation on how to get back into the capital city, the main areas. Where, where you were bound to go uh, anyway. So I think it all comes hand in hand. You have to look at the entire logistics process, not just like, well, here's an airport you landed, but if you now have to sit in a car for three hours, right. or you have to take the ferry, that defeats the, the, the entire purpose. So I mean, it, it's, a big, it's a big picture that it all has to come together. The good news is that it already exists in other parts of the world, and you just have to kind of sort of replicate it because that's what, what the market is used to, what, what these people, uh, do and expect, and it's just a matter of catching up with the times. And it is going to be compounded once we have these unmanned flying drones all over the place. It's, 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 it's going to get even more complicated. So I feel that these markets are three or four steps behind, while others are now trying to figure out how we're going to handle these unmanned and the drones and everything. So they definitely have to catch up, and again, I think the growth is, is, is happening much quicker than what the planning or maybe they are planning for it, but to execute it and to build, you're talking about a decade or two, and technology is just getting faster and faster and faster, and it's gonna to come to a point where it's just gonna burst at the seams. And I think yesterday um, on one of the panels we were, for the security risk when we were talking about these drones and going in and asking the questions, I think the governments just are not, they don't have a plan, a lot of them. Um, like you said, business aviation is often the afterthought. You know, in Hong Kong, Phil Walmer was talking at the ASVA AGM about how the, the noise situation that we have at night where the aircraft like a Gulfstream 650 can't take off um, and it's quieter than these 777s taking off at night at 1 a.m. Why is that? We were never in the budget. Business aviation was never considered when they put together the noise allocation for the airport. So it's very often that they don't realize the value that we bring. You know, we're one aircraft with two passengers, lower max takeoff weight, we buy less fuel, um, we take up runway space, we take up slots from the airlines and cargo. Uh, and they, they're looking at the dollar sign there, but they're failing to realize that the GDP value that they're bringing in 
is very different. You know, when Bloomberg comes to Hong Kong, when Starbucks goes, and they bring the CEO, are they bringing, you know, just the fuel sales and the, the ta tax for that day? No, they're employing direct employment, and they also have an effect on the economy, a stimulus. And if they can't come in, I mean, we've had also, uh, Owners Universal has seen over a 50% drop in just requests in the last 18 months. Uh, and we've had people tell us they don't come to Hong Kong with their jets anymore. And while the situation is improving, why is it improving? Because they're not coming. So now we're going to have a situation where the aircraft think, oh, it's better, I can come in now, and then we'll hit the same point again until we have the relief. Yeah, and I also believe that there's a negative stigma in some of these countries from what the folks that used to fly private 20, 30 years ago. It was probably a, you know, a, 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 cor a corrupt, not really, uh, you know, maybe a politician or someone that wasn't really a jobs creator. So there is a negative stigma, or is this a spoiled, um, rich guy, who cares type of mentality that I would think that, that is within, inside the government, as opposed to looking at it as uh, the, these are job creators. I, you know, if, if, if you make this uh, possible and available, you're going to get larger companies, Fortune 500s, 100s, to come in and want to expand and, and build the economy. And, and I think that somehow we need to break that stigma. It's the same thing in South America. Uh, you get a lot of this, um, well, private aviation is for that 0.1%. We, we are, we are pre-programmed uh, to, to really hate these people, right? So why am I going to make their life easier? I'd rather get out of family that wants to go on, on vacation. So I think there's even a lot of that, as opposed to having people within the government that can appreciate the power of this from an economic standpoint and actually make it accessible and available to, to, uh, you know, to grow their, their own economies. And I, and I think that's also going to be a sticking point on why it is that general aviation is kind of like the stepchild in a lot of these places. Because it was associated with corruption, the uber government elite, which is who in their specific countries were allowed to have access to that, versus a Mark Zuckerberg or a person who started a company and did very well and now has a jet. Go ahead, Mark. My, my personal view is, um, uh, and I think we'd all agree on this, um, you know, our product is a good one. It's a business tool. And yes, we do need to get that message continually over. Um, but actually, the, the conviction in the ownerships uh, will come through uh, the customer experience. And anything that affects the customer experience, um, whether it's the, the transit time downtown, whether it's the slot situation, whether it's a case you can't actually park your aircraft, um, at the, the airport you're flying to and you're having to reposition. Now repositioning, there's a cost to that. Um, maybe if you have a, a $60 million jet, that's a secondary. Um, but the primary here is it's about flexibility. You know, if he gets an urgent meeting, if he needs to depart, um, and also that security of having your aircraft there. And if you do need to reposition, that does affect the customer experience. Um, so I think uh, our job is twofold. One is communication, um, and I think We've all got a responsibility there, as well as the, the trade bodies, uh, lobbying. Um, I think it's been very successful in the US, uh, particularly uh, MBAA. Um, you know, have pushed very hard there, and it's more understood um, than Europe, um, Middle East. Um, there's no real challenge. Um, but again, I think our product speaks for itself, and where we have to push is, as I say, with permissions, permits, parking, um, anything that affects the customer experience. When does the customer experience start and when does it finish? Um, I think it's when they leave the hotel to when they get to their home. It's all the way through. And anything that affects that, whether it's negatively or positively, is either going to assist or, or not um, in uh, expanding business aviation. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think the communication aspect that you just touched on is, is critical. You know, in, in Asia Pacific, we have many different countries, different languages, and the governments are not necessarily talking to each other. Um, but, you know, in Dubai, they use OCS. They also use OCS in Hong Kong. They had, they had it in Thailand. I'm not sure if many of you know this, but last year, I think they um, were not paying the bills, so OCS access was removed. So now all permits and processing is manual. In Thailand. So now if you think about technology today and we heard from Nathan Andrews yesterday with Satcom Direct and the connectivity that we have and the capabilities that we have and the speed of the internet in the sky and yet the, the authorities are still using pen and paper. And in, in the Philippines for example we have to drive back and forth. I mean it takes three hours for paperwork because 
you're driving, your permit, getting it signed by one office, taking it to the next office, to the next office, and then getting it back, manually filing of flight plans. And we're in an age where, you know, we have the internet on our phones, we have them in the air. Um, we shouldn't be doing this manually. And if we can have similar systems, or if everyone's on OCS and they can talk to each other, this whole slot um, constraint with the two airports, it can become a smarter way of traveling. And I think that's something that we all need to go back in when we're talking with our governments, make sure that they're aware of this and, and help be part of the solution um, and see. Yeah, I, th I think this is a key point here. Most governments don't understand general aviation facilities. Um, you know, they think we're the step redheaded stepchild. Sorry, David, I still love you. Um, but, you know, I think that's the key thing. ASBA, as associations like ASBA, MBAA, um, you know, AFPA, all the EBAA, we need to work together and make sure we're giving a consistent message and uh, making sure that the connectivity, you know, they, they talk about the, the trains and the belt, one like in um, Greater Bay Area in Hong Kong with Shenzhen and Zhuhai and the bridge with, between Macau. It's, it's still a vehicle, but at the same time, maybe they can drive their car across faster than they can taking their jet and going to the other facility and then getting in a helicopter and having their bags come over by ferry. So these are things that they're not really considering in their planning phase, so we need to be a part of that solution. In your, uh, one of the questions, in your opinion, are there many people using unethical methods to get permit slots, et cetera, when operating in Asia? Yes. Well, 100%. We could do a poll on that. <laughs> um, I think we did actually do a poll, polling question on that as well. Uh, I, I worked for an operator for five years out of Hong Kong and it was very clear which companies were making payments and which were not because like Fabian said, you know, you, you have a company that follows the rules and, and says that this is how long it takes to get a permit, 72 hours, and then they, they reject you, you go somewhere else, you pay a little bit more money, all of a sudden you have your permit. And they may disguise it, they may say that they're that's just their internal fee, they lump it into the ground handling, but where is that money going? And Paul touched on this yesterday, just because you don't know about it, you can, doesn't mean that you're free. The FCPA and the UK Bribery Act, they, they have all these definitions in place that can still get you in trouble. So just because you're outsourcing your corruption doesn't mean that you, know, you can get away with it. <laughs> Um, will it be an even playing field in the near future? Most of you guys say 80%. I mean, Fabian, have you That's seen bad. any improvement in South America? No, I mean, I, I think there is an improvement because as this stuff starts to come up and you get more operators and people start complaining and it, it, it at some point, I think there, the, the pendulum does, you know, just kind of shift in the other direction. But um, it's just the way it is. I think if you remove the, the, the states, you know, North America, including Canada and Europe out of the equation, I think everyone else is just the way business is conducted and it's just the way that it is. And it's a way of life in, in some of these places, especially when what they get paid is, is not a lot of money. So people find alternative ways to, to feed their families and it's, it's unfortunate, but it just becomes the way uh, that it is. I mean, you land in Cuba and somebody's gonna probably try to, uh, if you leave your plane overnight, they're going to try to lower the air on your tire a little bit. So the next morning, you tip them 50 bucks to put it back in. You know what I mean? It's just, it, it's, it's what happens in some of these uh, places, uh, un unfortunately. And you have to know and have, you must have local resources and people that can help you out. I hope it changes, but I, I don't think it's realistic. I agree with you to a point there, Fabian. At the moment, it is a fact of life. I, I personally think it will evolve um, like most things. And... Uh, you know, it, it can't continue this way. And I think there's now with um, systems and IT, um, it's not going to be hard uh, to cut out of the middlemen. And, uh, you know, to me, one of the biggest challenges, um, having always worked for ethical operators, is we do things the right way. It's going to take period X. Somebody else is doing it another way, and it's going to take half the time. And from an ownership perspective, um, they don't always see the full picture. Um, what they're looking to do is depart now, not in 24 hours. And that's a challenge, uh, especially when you look at corruption and uh, the laws that exist. Yeah, the, the next question that we have here, is it realistic to believe regional governments will support general aviation when a large majority are registered offshore, thereby avoiding domestic tax revenues? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, it, it's, one of those, it's one of those questions where 
it's the chicken or the egg. Uh, you know, if it, it, taxes shouldn't be that high. I think it's been proven time and time again that if taxes are low, your revenue goes up. So do you want 90% of nothing, or do you want 20% of everything? That's, that's really what you add, and I think the, the U.S. just kind of proved that by lowering the taxes. You have the left going nuts, saying that it was a break to the rich, yet they've now had the largest revenue influx in the first quarter of this year than they ever have with higher taxes. So um, they should support it because, again, it, it, it grows the economy. It, it's, it's just the, the, I think you're hurting yourself by saying, well, they registered it offshore, so therefore now we're not going to help them come in here. It, 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 I, I think that's shooting yourself uh, in the foot. I think the better question is, why are they registering it offshore? What are the benefits that they're getting that you're not offering? And you probably should if you want economic growth in your own countries. I certainly agree with uh, what Fabian said there. Um, the other part to this is the basing of aircraft. Um, this is something that we've had uh, come in in the Middle East, some restrictions on the basing of foreign aircraft. And what they were trying to do was tackle uh, a subject called Grey Charter, which I may touch upon a bit later, but I promise very briefly. Um, but uh, the basing of aircraft, whether they're foreign or national, is a good thing uh, for our business. Um, and what am I talking about? I'm talking about the support of FBOs, of maintenance, of infrastructure, everything from local hotels, transportation. So having a, a fleet based at your airport within your country is a good thing, uh, generally speaking, uh, for our business. Uh, the registry, again, going back to what uh, Fabian said there, um, you know, if the, the incentives are right, people are going to register. If they're not, they're going to look to go elsewhere. Absolutely. Um, I think we're running a few minutes over, um, but why do you think overflight permissions and landing permits still exist in 2018? Looks like our audience thinks it's both to protect national security and to generate revenue, but also there's um, a lot of people thinking that it's only to generate revenue. Do you think that it, it, there would be another mechanism that we can advise the governments if we take away the landing permits and the fees associated with it make it a bit easier to fly? How else can we help them generate revenue so that they still... Give us what we need. In terms of ownerships and uh, you know the fee structure of um, permits, you know we know some countries are charging three thousand, six thousand dollars for a couple of permits. Now that's far too high. As an owner of an aircraft, that's one thing. It's not great, but bearable. But for the charter customer, that may be the difference between them flying on a private jet or going commercially. And in this one, we do battle with the airlines a little bit. And, uh, you know, if we can get the fee structure down to a reasonable level, um, and again, the e-system, by cutting out the middle men, and I think the plural there, men, rather than uh, man, there's lots of middle men in, in these things. Um, and, you know, that's going to boost traffic, and if you boost traffic, it boosts, na boosts national revenue, and I think this is all part of the, the communication that we are responsible for. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, as far as the overflight permits and that, I... For whatever reason, I, I really don't have an issue with that and the government's even generating revenue for people using their airspace. I think it's theirs and that part is fine. As far as the landing permits and fees, um, it really only bothers or matters when you have one choice. But take, for example, Boston International Airport. It's very expensive. Everybody that flies private knows that if you land there, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. So you pick three or four or five surrounding airports that's going to get you into the vicinity, and you're going to pay a lot less. No different than going into JFK versus going into Teterboro White Plains. So I think when you have options, these fees then are different, and, uh, and, and it doesn't matter, and it doesn't play a major role, because now you have the option, and as a consumer and the client, you get to pick what you're willing to spend and where you're willing to land. I think the biggest issue, obviously, in Asia is that you have one airport, one landing fee, there's no competition, there's no option, and it is what it is, and you almost feel like yeah, you're, you know, stuck with you're, it. You're, you're stuck with whatever it is, so therefore you want to not like it, right? And I think this, this will probably be our last question, but does it make sense to be marketing biz jets and helicopters together as a package transportation solution? And both of you are involved in, in the charter industry. Do you think that your clients and customers would be willing to, as a package, travel in that manner? I think much depends on, on geography. Um, in terms of Dubai, I think I've already mentioned that it really doesn't work, uh, not at this time anyway. But then if we look at London, and I used to work for Harrods Aviation, Air Harrods, and it does work, and you can package them together in that scenario. So my point here is probably geography or city specific. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with him uh, 100%. I mean, if you're going into Sao Paulo, you really don't have a choice. You know, New York, same thing. If it's busy, you can go to White Plains, you can helicopter over. It's just a way of life in these certain geographical uh, places. So as far as charter, yes, I had read the question wrong. I thought that should, the, should we sell the owners both in a helicopter and airplane at the same time? And that would have probably been no. But as far as a charter package deal, absolutely. Right, are there any other questions from the audience before we move on to the next panel? David, did you have a question? Are you, are you calling a friend? Yes. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone very much. If you have any more questions, um, feel free to find us uh, for the rest of the day. Thanks.